Hello. Uh, I am Kiriti Sen Gupta. I live in Delhi. Uh, first thank uh, goes to uh, Bitan Chakraborty, who I you know who uh, brings us all alive here, both on YouTube and Facebook. And today I am here to listen to a few poets, academics, as well as uh, to say a few lines. a few words about a book which is only 4 months old which has 39 poems a book that bears 100 pages a book that was released back in september 2021 the last year a book of poems in fact academic and poet jhilam chotturaj's second book of poems noise cancellation i welcome all of you to this engaging session where we have poet critic and interviewer dustin pickering an academic and scholar Stella Chitralekha Biswas among us thank you dustin thank, thank you stella for joining us and the center stage belongs to the author jilam chotturaj better to uh, address her as dr chotturaj who is the author of noise cancellation a book of poems you all uh, are probably aware of who dr chotturaj is but let me say a few words introducing her to you to the audience jhilam chotturaj is an academic and poet based in hyderabad she has authored the books corporate fiction popular culture and the new writers 2018 and the poetry collection when lovers leave and poetry stays her works have been published in journals like queen mobs tea house colorado review world literature today and asian cha among other places she received cti excellence award in literature and soft skills development in the year 2019 from the council for transforming india and the department of language and culture government of telangana her new book noise cancellation as i uh, as i said earlier was released in september 2021 by hawakal publishers private limited well this is the book as you all can see it's a cute little book of 100 pages i repeat but chilam is visibly proud she tells the hindu that she is grateful to life for emerging out of the pandemic with a poetry book something good to offer to the world this this these are chilam's word uh to the national daily the hindu uh before i uh request dustin or stella to say a few words about the book let me read a few lines from the praises that noise cancellation has been able to secure for the past 4 months well this is an excerpt from uh, from the review by dr shayun aij bhomik and this review was published in kitab that says noise cancellation is a curious book of poems one may be tempted to believe that the poems that have found a place in this beautifully edited and curated collection that deal only with the oral and the picture on the cover 
may only accentuate that belief. But as one enters into the very private and protected world of this book, one is taken aback by the absolute riot of emotions springing upon the reader, a kind of a happy surprise that one gets opening a box of gifts. So according to Shion Ijbhomik, noise cancellation is nothing less than a gift. In another critic published in Cafe de Census, retired Professor B. Gopal Rao writes, Jilam's poems are terse and jargon free. She has competently absorbed and made her own modes of approaching by talking candidly about some of the challenges and difficulties one faces in negotiating the untrodden corridors of life. Jilam demonstrates in her discussion of poems how inseparable and impeccable are the key titles she has chosen for her poems. They blend artistically into coherent thematic structures by aptly designing the compositions with meticulous ease. Another review, another very interesting review by Dr. Lal Din Pui, who works in the Department of English, Pachunga University College in Mizoram. She writes in her praise, noise cancellation is relevant in a world where everyone has been unsettled by the pandemic. Poems like noise cancellation and poets of the pandemic offer a sense of relief and release from the anxiety that surrounds us. In a time when the future seems bleak and hopeless, there is comfort. There is comfort and hope in all the poems. Well-known, very well-known literary critic from India, Simin Ali, writes in her appreciation, the book is not just about personal relationships. It extends to look at the relationship people have with a location, with themselves. The struggle that one faces when outside of one's comfort zone extends to a geographical spaces as well, resulting in discovering the multiple layers that a self can carry, either creating new ones or destroying versions of one's self in a lifetime. So this four month old book of poems by Dr. Jhilam Chaturaj has been able to fetch rave reviews across the globe, be it in the Colorado Review, which is a prominent literary journal in the United States, or in the Hong Kong Review, or in academic venues or venues for literary discussions in India. Noise cancellation has achieved a place for herself. I, I like uh, a book is like gender wise, it's she. So uh, it's, uh, the book has achieved a place for herself in a quick span of only four months. But here today we have poet Dustin Pickering. I have not read a single line from his review, which was published in Colorado Review. The reason being, since we have the reviewer with us tonight, I would be very excited to ask him, Dustin, if you can remember, when I sent you a review copy of noise cancellation to your Houston address, can you tell us what was your initial remark as you open up the envelope, which was delivered by Mazen? I was quite excited to, to receive the parcel and I um, love the cover. Uh, it's beautiful. And I, I was very excited to read the book. Uh, I've I reviewed uh, 
Dr. Chiraj's first collection as well. And I felt this one was a dramatic uh, increase of, of her poetic prowess. So it was a wonderful book to read. And, and I'm really proud to have been able to publish in the Colorado Review the, uh, the, the review that was published there. Yes, Dustin. So uh, I, if I remember correctly, Dustin, you took only three to four days to finish the entire book. Yes. To read the poems, you read them again, and mm -hmm. then you approached your review. Yes. Uh, may I ask you, what was your experience like? Like, how did you approach the poems when you actually planned to write a full-fledged review for the book? Well, as I was reading through, and I do a, you know, I do annotations. I underline passages that I find remarkable, and I try to incorporate those passages into the review. And generally, look for broad themes. Uh, something I can say of ideas presented in a collection of poetry, and I did that with this book as well. And uh, the review took about two or three hours to write. Um, and it mm -hmm. went through the Colorado Review. I submitted it to them. And within about a month, they responded that they liked it. They thought it could use some, a little bit of editing. And it was a few very minor scrapes of, uh, you know, some phrases they added to the, to the review to clarify some ideas. And then us, they, they went ahead and published it. It took about three months to get on to their website after I submitted it. So it was a really remarkable process uh, that did not uh, add quite a, a bit of, uh, you know, to my writing, uh, you know, uh, credentials as well as to uh, my anticipation of continuing to publish my, my own work. So I was really proud of that, that uh, uh, participation in that in that review. Uh, do you have the copy handy? Of the book or the review? Of the book, of course. Oh, yes. Yes, I do. Actually, it's right here. Uh, can you show uh, the viewers a few of the lines that you underlined during the process of reviewing the book? Uh, yeah, I can't do that. Um, I can actually read some of these um, some of these lines. I have I pulled one up here. Um, you know, there's word there's phrases like even the nudes cannot survive the ordinary from uh, edible stain. And that's on page, page number 62, page 62. 62. Okay. Um, you know, I just quite a few lines that stood out. Um, but the, the poem Canine, which I felt was a definitive because the book, the cover is a picture of a kind of a mongrel dog. And I felt that was a very centralized uh, motif uh, that, the, that this poem presented to the, the collection. And I underlined years you packed in boxes and mm -hmm. desperate for a shelter home, my face on newsprint. Bruised air holds my words up to sentences. They don't ache for meanings. Ears stunned at mossed corners and coitus with machines. Yet I go nowhere. And that's from page 63 to 65. And there's yes, quite a few benign. strong lines. Very strong lines, I felt, were powerful, evocative, and I really um, enjoyed reading the entire collection for, the, for words, for phrases like that. Those are very powerful and, and um, images that I think have a lot of contemporary meaning. Of course. Thank you, Dustin. And before I come back to you again, it's mm -hmm. now Stella's time. Uh, Stella, thank you for joining us here together. Uh, may I ask you, uh, how did you approach noise cancellation? Like what, uh, what specialities you found when you read these poems? Well, the very first thing that caught my attention was the title itself. Uh, you okay. don't usually come across a collection of poetry that is titled Noise Cancellation. So that yes. is something that caught my eye immediately when Jilamdi approached me with her work and I came across her fantastic world of creative imagination. And uh, when I read the blurb that is given at the back and the very crisp, brief review of the book that was given, uh, the very first line said that the book envisions a sustainable consciousness. So that is something that, uh, again, struck a different chord within me. So apparently a book which is titled as Noise Cancellation and which appears to 
uh, you know, focus specifically upon the oral faculties. It goes on to expand and, uh, you know, uh, take in, like embrace a wider range of psychological and emotional affect. So uh, when I skimmed through the pages of this very slim volume that I received uh, from Chilamdi, uh, the very first poem, uh, Alu Posto, that obviously caught my attention. And being a Bengali, it brought out, you know, a, a wide range of emotions, both personal and cultural. And I myself am, uh, you know, I have a preference for reading traditional poetry, which is why I, uh, you know, like the poems in the first volume a little more than the shorter ones, which are written in, I think, Sinquin variants in the second section. So uh, the way in which she has, uh, you know, ordered the poems, all of them uh, do not really have a particular chronology. They just keep on, you know, uh, shuffling on like various songs in a playlist and they keep hitting you on different levels. Uh, you know, all of the poems, they combine together and they appeal to each one of your senses and each one of your uh, emotional, uh, emotional faculties in such a way that uh, they combine a very, uh, you know, a very different kind of, you know, they combine together to create this holistic feeling within you of something mm -hmm. that is, uh, you know, kind of uh, providing you with a source of spiritual and emotional replen uh, replenishment at the end. So, uh, and the language in which the author has written the work, uh, you know, you do not really find any worn out cliches or a lot of, uh, you know, uh, rhetorical outlandishness in the way in which she has framed these very crisply structured verses. So the language again caught my attention. And, uh, you know, I also took, uh, uh, I guess I would say about a week to finish the book and then I had to read it again. And I mm -hmm. have also written a review, which I had submitted at uh, the Outlook India magazine and uh, which will uh, you know, hopefully come out soon. Wonderful, wonderful Stella. So as you, as you say that uh, the cover and both the cover and uh, the title, they, they seem to be extremely interesting. And uh, if I'm right, uh, as soon as the book was released uh, sometime in September, it was the author who had a word with the Hindu about uh, the background story of the title Noise Cancellation. Uh, and in her interview with the Hindu, uh, Dr. Chatterjee says that conceived in 2019, the book's beginning was ordinary. When she wanted to buy, like when the author wanted to buy a set of headphones, her brother's suggestion of a few brands with a noise cancellation feature. This suggestion acted as a spiritual metaphor. Jhilam, now it's your turn. So the word noise cancellation as a feature to a headphone that you wanted to buy from a nearby store and as suggested by your brother, it acted as a spiritual metaphor. metaphor. So uh, do you believe, do you think that noise cancellation is a collection of poems and the entire volume exhibits a holistic approach to a lot of readers so how did you how did you get into the spiritual you know spiritual core of the psyche the spiritual core of the readers how how did you hit upon them Yeah, thank you. Great question. Um, well, uh, I had I, I wouldn't know whether I have been able to hit the spiritual core of readers, but I'm referring to my spiritual core when I, uh, you know, said that I don't want the Hindu. Yeah, that uh, the, the those words noise cancellation that was like a moment of epiphany for me, and that acted as a spiritual metaphor. Well, spirituality here does not refer to any religion, any God, but it yes. refers to a very strong, a consummate connection with my own self, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, you can say an intuition. 
rekindling my intuition and being connected to my own soul and my own thoughts that is spiritual for me my existence my emotions are spiritual for me and uh, i trust myself my vision a lot not that i don't trust others but but i believe that to be to do anything from your heart you need to be connected to your own self mm-hmm. and so um, you know i'm a very sensitive person so from time to time i find myself affected by the noise of the world uh, at a very deep and personal level as justin was reading those lines again from the poem can i mm-hmm. and uh, that was actually inspired i mean actually i i saw a dog you know looking desperately looking for its master and it had a leash on but it was just left on the road it was covered in dirt it was hurt it was bleeding in places and i felt terrible i couldn't like i couldn't stay still for days okay and i was also not in a position to adopt the dog so and, and i just kept thinking and this um, you know that's what poets can do we can just stay with the pain for some time and at mm-hmm. least honor the pain through our writings instead of just moving on or being a bystander so that was one thing and so there are different kinds of things that affect me a lot and at that point of time 2019 i felt like i was getting very distracted with many things that were happening and the social media landscape is one of them which i've referred there is uh, you know, there there's this uh, cacophony of politics fake news rumors right there's so many things that distract you and that disconnect you and you know kind of rips apart your existence but you right. can come back there are also ways in which you can come back and you can connect to your existence and at that point of time when you connect nothing else matters and how do you connect by respecting and honoring and cherishing your everyday life by little little things so there are a lot of plants that feature and here's monstera you know <laughs> by eating plants by eating good food by you know, observing your you know small things in life like alu posto just to see the posto being cooked having that patience and sitting at one place and doing nothing but to just to observe potatoes boiling you know in water that that is nourishing too so this mm-hmm. book as much as it is a spiritual metaphor for me the aim of this book is to spiritually nourish reader readers will tell me they have been which most of them they have said that yes we did find an anchorage you know when we were reading we felt a sense of belonging that right. yeah right. i felt that storm within me but when i was reading your poem i could find the calm i could find a way out especially with the ugadi pachri you know which i talk about the ugadi pachri which is a drink that is made during the telugu new year and which is a a combination of different flavors and that acts as a metaphor for you know kind of romantic relationships or marriage mm-hmm. marriage especially and, and how marriage is a combination of you know all sorts of flavors you got to take the shit you got to take the good things too so mm-hmm. you know and and many people have responded to me they said that yeah i mean you know that is how we felt i mean we felt we feel so parched sometimes and then it is also something that nourishes us marriage at the same time marriage is a raw mango a surprise turn of senses so in that way that was my objective that i am spiritually nourishing myself but can i create a work that would be equally helpful and kind of you know kind of just guide people a little and uh, i think i've been a little bit yeah you did it uh, you did it quite successfully jilam yeah. uh, uh like if i say this is a finely aromatic book i won't be wrong what do you say dustin finely what was your phrase a, a, a finely aromatic book aroma aroma hmm that's an interesting uh phrase there was a lot of um uh you know food references i believe and and it did have a lot of of um sensual images that i felt were you know appeal to the senses for sure yeah can you read a poem like uh, a poem that you found aromatic um let me see if i can think of one here um well here's a good one um it has a lot of you know taste feelings you know and and associated images of that you got up a chocolate 
It's page 56. 56. Okay. Mm -hmm. We wait for winds to curl our cup of sourness. Tamarind tails sweetened by the crush of joggery exhale the simmering breath of summer. Marriage is like a raw mango, a surprise turn of senses, a fallen Margosa blossom weeping on the night. We worship the moon, yet refuse the flourish of her nectar. We harden into peppercorns, fingers furious, tap the soundless heat of agitation. Our voice breaks into salt, white, grainy, afraid of losing hair, wings, and words. Finally, we melt into water, become the resonance of rivers singing between distances, and hold a pitcher full of antique gold swallowed by parched sentences. Wonderful. Thank you, Dustin. Very welcome. <clears throat> I'm sorry. So Stella, as Jilam writes in her poem, we melt into water. How fluid was her language in the book? Uh, as I said in my previous point, that the language was also one of the most interesting aspects of mm -hmm. Dr. Bilam's poetry that I found. Uh, there, uh, I mean, the way in which she frames her sentences, the way in which, uh, you know, all of these imageries, all of these symbols, they come together, they commingle together to leave a lasting impression on your mind. Uh, yeah. She doesn't, uh, you know, uh, take the stance of a very outlandish preacher uh, who wants to alienate or overwhelm her readers in any way. Mm -hmm. But uh, there is this certain, uh, if I may use the term, uh, you know, there is a certain, uh, you know, kind of versatility that I find within her writing, the way in which she frames her language. Uh, you know, uh, she obviously experiments with the structure, with the stylistic aspects of her language to quite some extent, but uh, I don't think that would make reading her works a very difficult thing for the readers. Uh, perhaps it uh, spices up their interest and their curiosity even further to explore the range of emotions and the synesthetic experience that mm -hmm. her poetry sort of promises to bring about. So, so to support your statement, Stella, can you read a poem from the book, please? Uh, I'm very sorry. I do not have a copy of the book at hand. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm equally sorry. Uh, for like, uh, Jilam, I couldn't. Would I like couldn't to read out a few poems. Uh, sure, sure, um, sure. Jilam, please, uh, can you like to support Taylor's statement? Like, whatever, like you know, she is delivering. Can you can you read a poem or two from the book, please? Yeah, sure, I could do that. Uh, but I, I did send Stella a copy. You know, Kiritida is very um, strict. She has told me whoever is doing so, you must a review or something, you must send a copy. So a copy has been sent. So we I have a copy of the book, but uh, I apologize. <laughs> it's, it's, on your, it's on your way. I, yeah, it's on your way. No, no, it is no, there. I, Maybe I have right it. now I have she it doesn't hand. have it. Yeah, I she do oh, have I, Okay, okay, okay. I do have a copy of the book. Okay. Right now she does not have it. So that's okay. Should I read Sari? Yes, please. Stella Anything is, that, that talks my... about the uh, fluidity of your language. Yeah, I would like to read about, I would like to read, you know, Sari or there's a lot of poems and uh, I have read Sari actually. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I can read, uh, I can read one poem that I've not read anywhere. I mean, no one asked uh, me about it. Just, so, just a minute, just a minute, uh, Jila. Uh, Stella, if you ca can, you remember any one or two poems from the collection that yeah. actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, that uh, the poems that uh, actually surprised you, uh, one uh, poem or hit actually, you hard? Yeah, one poem that I actually really liked from the collection was, uh, I think, Park Street, twentieth February, twenty twenty. Uh, so Jilam, can you like... read that poem? Yeah, okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll read that. It's at page number 23. So if you 23. want to see. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Kiritida, when was it written? It was written at the time that I went to Kolkata for the Oxford event. Yeah. Um, so you are <laughs> partly responsible for this poem. So. Thank you. 
Okay. Park Street, Kolkata, 28th February, 2020. In the lake, the arms of the temples and the mosques are locked in each other's reflections. Taken from Farewell, the country without a post office by Aga Shahid Ali. 23rd February, 2020. Infinite fury in the streets of Delhi. Blood songs of dappled gods bellowed beyond beginning. Five days later, at Park Street, Kolkata, Friday ushered humans high on spring. In multitudes, they loosened hope. Sweet hymns, wet with rain, cleared the country's fog. Alleys, puzzles, effulgence. One could not tell the religion of gods. I saw with a pilgrim's eye, lips praying, singing, waiting, loving. Biryani-flavored winds lifted the thick lanes. Hawkers yelled prices of flowers, stoles, and keychains. Children cried over cheap ice creams. Their mothers bargained shoes and bangles. Could the same souls disembowel the city? Dance of the debris of difference? Such are the melodies of my pendulous nation. Endless ceremonies for sensual joys. Some bring belief with fire and knives. Some preach faith like paper kites. Thank you. Thank you, Jiram. That was a fabulous poem. Dustin, a question to you. Okay. In this poem, Jilam writes, endless ceremonies for sens sensual joys. I repeat, endless ceremonies for sensual joys. How relevant do you find this particular uh, line of phrase when, when you, uh, like, you know, when you uh, think about India? Because <laughs> I know, I'm sure you, you have quite a few Indian friends, Indian poets whom you know. Mm -hmm. whom you talk with on a regular basis. So endless ceremonies uh, of uh, for sensual joys. How relevant is this line according to you? Well, I find that uh, people of India are, are very um, uh, friendly. I will say that very, very affectionate and friendly and sensual to me is, is obviously it's a very um, heartfelt word i mean it has a very to me i i think when i hear sensual i think soft like something soft and and deep and and it has you know texture or touch you know what or some kind of you know it's a very um affectionate kind of feeling to it for me and as far as uh you know the relevance to the book i feel like that it's a very good line to to, to um you know, pull out to parse out from the book to describe uh, the way that I think she, you know, Dr. Chataraj pulls out a lot of images and, and thoughts from, you know, the common life uh, and uses those in, in a way that uh, makes it reminds us that these things are meaningful as compared to the digital screen or the news agencies that are promoting, you know, uh, division and, and as she said earlier, fake news and whatever else, um, rumors and so forth. So I think that brings us back to the central idea that life in front of us is very important as well. And I think that was, a, it's a wonderful line to, to, to take from the book to describe, you know, the, that that's a very wonderful line. Thank you, Dustin. Uh, uh, like Stella, do you, do you uh, hold the same uh, notion that uh, when Jilam writes, uh, endless ceremonies for sensual joys did she mean the same like uh, did she want to uh, like convey the same message as dustin uh, explains yes absolutely like in a world with uh, you know demanding deadlines and uh, you know soul sucking schedules i think uh, the author tries to make us realize that we are after all human beings and we mm -hmm. need to realize this essential humanness within us uh, the world which mm -hmm. is trying to mechanize us into working robots, sticking to certain uh, you know, uh, aspects of routine life and mundaneness. 
that is trying to drown out the very essence of our uh, you know our own sublimity of our need to get in touch with certain uh, you know aspects of uh, aesthetic experience so uh, genome's works uh, you know they uh, you know they try to nourish us in a very wholesome way not just one particular aspect of your mind but also every uh, you know aspect of your uh, you know of your emotion of your psychological being the way in mm-hmm. which you think and perceive about uh, the little uh, nit grits of everyday life uh, mm-hmm. i was taken aback that each of the poems uh, actually focus on very simple aspects of daily life you do not find a lot of uh, grandiose deliberations and uh, you know uh, complicated philosophies being thrown at us by the writer Uh, she chooses to focus on and i would say in a very microcosmic way on some of the things that are apparently uh, very trivial but they are not mm-hmm. to be dismissed as banal i think that is where the relevance of her writing lies we tend to rethink the way in which uh, we are looking at life around us we tend to rethink our patterns of uh, perceiving the world around us we need to uh, you know take breaks in between to stop and uh, you know delve into such um, you know little moments of spiritual uh, replenishment that mm-hmm. you know dr jilam chatterjee's poetry offers us so yeah i absolutely oh. agree with what dustin has said of course of course because you know i i am not in a position and i should not ideally ask uh, the poet although she is present here that what exactly did you uh, did you want to convey when you when you know when you wrote this particular line uh, uh, like uh, sensory joys endless ceremonies what was the page number it was uh, 23 23 23 yeah 23 the, the that line is in uh, is at the next page 24 24 yeah endless ceremonies for sens- sens- uh, sensual joys but if we read the poem one one more time there are two beautiful lines written in it children cried over cheap ice creams and remember the poem is titled park street kolkata 28th february 2020 you just forget the date we we better think about the location it's park street one of these most sophisticated areas in calcutta where the poet where jilam finds children cried over cheap ice creams and the mothers bargained for shoes and bangles this is a very common scene the like common occurrence in and around park street area so the you know uh, although the poem is titled according to uh, to the name of the location according to the location of particular location in calcutta Uh, the poem elaborates or talks about the various contradictions that happen on a regular basis on a day to day basis where children you know i'm sure jilam was not talking about uh, children from the upper strata because children belonging to the upper strata they won't ever cry for cheap ice creams whereas their mothers are you know a bargaining for shoes and bangles so even in one of the most sophisticated areas in calcutta we can look at children belonging to the lower strata of the society and there lies the beauty of this poem this is a marvelous poem jilam congratulations once again and before we conclude this session we are eager to hear you read a few poems probably that you have read before for any of the shows thank you um marvelous deliberation so i guess no i wish we could have this as a written form and we could publish it in a journal maybe let's see and uh, very relevant questions kirti da uh, thank you for bringing out the essence of the book in so many ways and uh, we could have a huge deliberations on this deliberation on this poem park street 
And as you said, yes, there is a reflection of the class division because as you said, when we think of Park Street, we always think of something very sophisticated when the rich kids go. But yeah. on a Friday evening after the Friday prayers are said, you can see people from all, you know, uh, you know, diverse social classes. And from the all the walks of life, yeah, yeah. Yes. Everyone has their share of fun in their own way. And that was so beautiful for me to see that there was, religion was not a barrier at that time. It was the place. People from everyone was having fun. I mean, you know, they're just sitting on the pavement and they're just watching everyone else and that's fun for them. So, yeah, so as you said, for me, I need to read a few poems. Um, I'll take, um, as Stella and as uh, Dustin, both of them pointed out, one is that how uh, one of the important aspects of this book is to present things that are mundane, they're not trivialized, you know, and the ordinary is highlighted as the beautiful, as the necessary, as the, you know, the the a source for of nourishment. And uh, one of the poems that I will read now is The Toil of the Toddy. Okay, a page, it is at page 25, where I talk about the life of the toddy tappers of southern India. I mean, I've seen them in southern India primarily, across Andhra, Telangana, Maharashtra. And uh, while I was on a trip at a place in Andhra Pradesh, and I was watch, I watched this story tappers, how they live, where they live, their children, and uh, it is actually this poem is born of one image where I saw the father carrying back the toddy home, and the children, you know, they're all busy with their phones. Oh, uh, they're watching something on the phone, and I was wondering, like, would they be? doing the same thing as their father did. So here it goes without more explanations. Toil of the toddy. Earthen pitchers hang from palmyra trees like earrings of an antique Egyptian woman. Faithful men gather at her feet, stirring sea-lipped summers into her tubular sway. The tapper must lay hungry children to sleep his shoulders carry heirlooms of generations who own nothing but the tongue of palm leaves. Frothy desires recline in the pallid drowse of cool toddy wine. Dark, wet bodies extract the dew of dawn, and if city folks desire, they cut through the twilight to hold drop by drop the oozing warmth of a mellow song. The city does not care. Only the river knows the ache of trees that have cradled the disappearing men into manhood. Only the palm grows shiver each time the young sons deny the rope, the climb, the pot of pleasure and tap the air for the sweet wound of knowledge. Thank you. Wonderful, uh, Jiram. Thank you. Uh, yes. uh, my 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 eyes stuck at the words "antique Egyptian woman." Uh, Dustin, can you hear me? Yeah, Jiram yes, writes. Yes. Yes. Antique Egyptian woman, page number twenty-five. Uh, like uh, Jiram, can you give me a second? Uh, like I want to discuss this particular phrase. Uh, uh, Justin, uh, what is your take on antique Egyptian women, if I may ask? It's an interesting... Uh, writes, uh, earrings of an, earrings of an mm -hmm. antique Egyptian woman. What is the inevitability of the word antique in this life? I feel like it places the... Uh, you know, it's, it starts with earthen pitchers hang from palmyra mm -hmm. trees. So it, mm -hmm. what it, I feel like what she's doing here is placing a very um, interesting historical context to a common thing, a very, um, t you know, it's very common, uh, you know, trees and so forth are very simple things that we take for granted. And she's putting a, a you know, a really almost like a, a museum type feel to this. So it gives it a lot of relevance that, brings to life the the fact that even though this is a very common sight 
it, it mm -hmm. brings something of the nature of, of uh, history into the, so it's very, it's not just a, uh, a poem referring to, you know, the trees, she's not just talking about trees, but she's bringing in a historical reference or historical feel as well as like the cosmetic feel to it, like earrings of an antique Egyptian woman. So yeah, that, very... that I understand, Dustin, but what made me more interested is uh, the poet hasn't used the word ancient. She wrote antique Egyptian woman. Why mm -hmm. the word antique? Can you guess? Well, that's a Just very so human any, word. Any, any, any wild guess. Instead of the word ancient, poet, mm -hmm. the poet used, wrote Antique. I think the word antique has a little more of a, a human feel to it than ancient. Uh, ancient, I guess I was referring to like how it was historical sounding. Antique, it gives it an, a feeling of um, human touch. Almost like a sentimental, you know, kind of like you think of an antique that has the connotation of a, a collectible or something meaningful rather than ancient is more, I don't know, it would be almost more academic sounding. Right, right. Thank you so much, Dustin. Jilam, the next four. Yeah, please. I think that's a, that's a great question. Why not ancient? Why antique? Well, uh, actually, I thought over this while write, writing this, and I'm so glad you brought this up, Kirtida. And uh, I shouldn't be answering it, but I'm so tempted <laughs> to just, uh, just kind of, you know, interrupt here and just say that... Um, uh, I debated a lot between antique and ancient, and there were a few other substitutes. But you know, antique sort of gave it a sacrilege kind of a uh, feeling to it because mm -hmm. you have not seen the trees. If you see the trees, these palmyra trees, you know, mm -hmm. and these are huge trees, Dustin. You can just Google and see an image, or I'll try to send you some images that I took. And when the mm -hmm. pots they hang around and. See, this is the tree that is giving livelihood to so many people, right? Okay. okay. And how much, how much are they earning? Very little. And it's it's and what is the business? The business of pleasure. They're getting some drink, right? Which is intoxicating. Okay. And they're, it, they're they're doing it for you know uh, you know kind of people from the city from the village who come for like a weekend to the village and they want to get drunk and they want to have like a good time. Okay. And these people, whenever it is, it's like Zomato, you know, they don't have a time restriction. If there's demand, if it's at seven o'clock at night, the fellow has to get up on the tree with mm -hmm. a very basic equipment. And the tree also has to give food, the, give the juice. The juice should be ready. Right. So look at how much the, the ecosystem around this tree, a palmyra tree, and these men who have been doing this work for generations. Okay. Mm. They, they, that's their caste. That, that's how they, that's how, I mean, I shouldn't use the word caste, but that, that's their profession, you know, they, they do that. So mm -hmm. I, I thought there is something very respectable, very holy, very sacri sacrilege to it. And so, and, and something so feminine, like a woman who gives so much to the world, you know, you, yeah. so again, whatever you give to a woman, she'll double it and triple it and give it back to you. Okay, so, so <laughs> this this was like the queen, the pharaoh, you know, the trees were like queens reigning the land and giving food and money and enjoyment to, you know, insignificant mortals like us. So I, I could say I use it in that sense. So, yeah, so I think I'll conclude by reading the one poem, the dog poem that I never get to read. Uh, okay. Is it canine? The uh, canine, I, Dustin has referred to it. So okay, okay, okay. One more. There's another dog poem, a husky in Hyderabad. And, uh, you know, page huskies number? Are, sorry, page number 27. 27, okay. Yes. So, um, you know, huskies are very fashionable dogs. And uh, people, uh, you will see them, you know, they need all ACs. And, uh, of course, in a hot country like this. But when I see them, and, you know, I have observed uh, how beautiful their eyes are. And I wonder that, um, do they ever long for the cold, the ice? I mean, that's where they were born. They were, mm -hmm. They're not meant to be kept as, you know, kind of decorative pieces in the houses of rich people. So this poem comes out from no offense to anyone, no criticism here, but it's just an observation which all poets do. So here is 
me uh, talking about the husky or, you know, it is the voice of the husky. The husky is the speaker. The dog is the speaker of this poem. A husky in Hyderabad. They do not see my shadow shrinking through seven Indian summers. Can white walls, chill air, flowing from spent splendid vents, sing of the Siberian snow? I'm a furry delight among opulent plots, but in my heart's core, I hear bells ringing through the plains of Alaska. Bring back my canine gait, my northern heirlooms. The silken breath is weary of fancy photographs, games, and names. Nothing adds memory to my muscles. Too foreign for the dogs of the Deccan. I cannot sleep under park benches. Some, sorry, I cannot sleep under park benches. Aimlessly stare at the steam escaping the biryani. Walk into greasy alleys, swollen with a sea of faces, their noses inspecting the air for kebabs, cumin, and cinnamon. There's a lover, ripe as mangoes but I wish to be thawed in icy embraces. I see home, silent sledgeways, my wolfish howl shattering the sacred woods when I birth children unafraid of sunless skies. Midnight glimmer on frozen domes, lonely, laden-eyed animal waits and imagines crystal waters and floating stones. Thank you. Very sensitive, very sensitive, extremely sensitive. So a human being and an academic and a poet writing on behalf of a husky. That makes it even more interesting, Sheila. Thank you all. Thank you so much for being with us uh, for this evening uh, of an event that surrounds noise cancellation, which is undoubtedly an expensive proposition for anyone using a headphone. And I believe, you know, <laughs> because not all headphones come with this feature called noise cancellation. Headphones, which are expensive, only they have this feature called noise cancellation. And I'm sure, Jilam, with your sensitive portrayal of human emotions and, of course, emotions of the, of the canines, you have indeed made this book, a real treasure, which is sophisticated, which is expensive, and readers from all over the world will definitely cherish its presence in the days to come. Thank you so much. Dustin, Stella, thank you once again. Jilam, uh, thank you for making this evening even more sensitive and sensible. Goodbye.